Hello and welcome to Mid-American Gardener, the show where you call in and our panel of experts answer all your questions. It's a great time of year, so I'm sure you have lots of questions tonight. I'm Shane from Country Arbor's Nursery and I'm your host and I'm taking over for Sandy Mason this evening. And she's left me with a fantastic panel to answer those questions. But in order for you to ask those questions, you've got to call in. And the phone number to call in is 217-333-3495. And usually this time of year, there's a lot of questions, so you want to get in early. But again, before we get to those questions, I'm going to introduce the panel this evening. And today we have Kent Miles, and I'll let Kent introduce himself and tell him a little bit more about himself. Okay. Thanks, Shane. Uh, my name is Kent Miles, and I am the owner of Illinois Willows. We are a specialty cut flower grower uh, located in western Champaign County. Um, we will answer questions on cut flowers, perennials, um, woody ornamentals like lilac or bittersweet or winterberry even. Uh, we got a couple emails here. Uh, one of them uh, we got tonight is a uh, horsetail problem. It comes from John, and we've had several other uh, inquiries on this subject on how to get rid of it. Um, horsetail uh, is a common name. Uh, snake grass is another name. Uh, generally goes by equisetum as the problem. And uh, I'll start off with a benefit. But it works wonderful in a container that is uh, without a drain hole, as far as the enclosed container, as a potted plant on a patio or a deck. Um, this is one of the photos that sent in from the uh, caller on the email. And um, it says, several years ago, I planted horsetail as an ornamental plant, uh, and it's taken over big time. How do I get rid of it? We have uh, 3.45 acres of land and I planted it in the back with prairie plants, and now I have about a half acre of it, and it's spreading and encroaching on everything. So there are two ways to control the equisetum. Uh, one way would be a chemical application, and in using that, you want to follow label directions, um, apply it on a non-windy day, uh, long pants, long sleeve shirt, uh, perhaps eye protection in case it, the wind does pop up on you. Uh, you need to do be very persistent in it, and that is going to mean several applications, um, four to six applications during the summer, spring, and summer. In the springtime, you want to cut it back as much as possible. Um, the plant will grow by underground runners or root. Uh, if the roots are disturbed, it'll break off and it'll send up new uh, plants at that time. Uh, you also want to uh, cut off any of them that have a kind of a cone or a dome on top of the stems. Those are where the spores are going to come from, and they will uh, disperse and start uh, new plants. Uh, what you want to do is cut it all back in the springtime, uh, gather it all your material, and put it in plastic uh, for the uh, lawn waste or not lawn waste, but for your uh, trash disposal. Uh, go on ahead and go ahead and apply the uh, herbicide, and it's going to have to take several applications to get rid of it. Uh, that's one way of eradicating it. Uh, the other way is doing a kind of a cultural, and that's where you're going to apply the lime to the soil. Um, Equisetum grows in a really more of acidic soil, so if you uh, go ahead and do a soil test to see where you're at there, um, one way of getting rid of it is by bringing the acidity or the uh, pH up to a 7 to an 8. Um, but in using the lime, you want to use about 2 pounds per every 100 square feet. Um, apply the lime, work it into the soil if you can. Uh, then go ahead and do a fertile application about two weeks after that. And then about Another two weeks, follow it with another lime application, then another fertilizer, another lime. And repeating that about four or five times uh, during the growing season uh, will help. And the type of fertilizer, you just want to use something synthetic. And um, it may take up to four or five years in doing it in a more of a cultural application. 
Yeah, it's going to take away to chase it out. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. it's a hard it, one because it's, it's a tough it's, one. It, it, yeah, it's usually in water too, so mm -hmm. so chemicals in water don't mix very well too. Right. So it's it's a pretty tough one that reminds you just don't plant it in an area yeah. that's going to spread like that. Well, thank you very much. We're going to move on to our next panelist, John. I'll let you introduce yourself. Uh, my name is John Bodensetter. <clears throat> I'm a Vermilion County Master Gardener. I like uh, perennials, hostas, tree shrubs. Uh, I have tomatoes is another one. I've got just about anything in my yard that turns green, I, I usually like to grow. Uh, I do have a question from Greg in Algonquin. Uh, it has to do with petunias. And each summer I plant uh, 10 inch hanging pots with petunias. Uh, he uses white madness as the com most common type, but he's done other colors and wave varieties as well. Usually uh, three to four in a pot. After the 4th of July, he trims them back to about half their size about mid July. Uh, they start dying back from the bottom. The leaves next to the soil start turning brown, and by mid-August, they are all dead. There are, <clears throat> they are on a brick patio on the south side of the house, but there is a large maple tree at the west end of the property that shades them from the sun. Uh, they get sun in the morning and early afternoon. I use miracle Grow uh, moisture control potting mix and feed them once a week with miracle Grow fertilizer. Uh, he's wondering what's happening. Um, The, probably the main thing is petunias really need acidic soil. And if, especially if you're using well water to, to um, water them, uh, the pH of the soil probably has changed dramatically. I know some of the um, uh, garden centers uh, use very strong acid to get them to stay healthy and, and vibrant. And uh, overwatering is another thing that we can do, or underwatering, especially in, under, uh, in uh, hanging baskets, we tend to underwater uh, our, our hanging baskets. Um, I usually like to use the finger test, go down about an inch. If it's damp, I, I don't, I don't uh, water. Um, it, during the real hot parts of the summer, you're probably going to have to water every day. But um, I think the main thing uh, is the um, um, uh, the pH of the soil. So check that. You can buy a pH tester or, or test it. Uh, the other thing I brought tonight, just something real quick, something new at the garden centers. This is uh, a popcorn plant. Uh, it's cassia popcorn is actually the type. Uh, and the reason they call it a popcorn plant, if you take one of these little leaves and crush it, it smells like buttered popcorn. It should be pretty popular this summer. You should be able to find it, but uh, uh, everybody is, is buying it this year just to try it. So uh, buy it early if, you're gonna, if you want to try one. Yeah, and it gets pretty good size. It gets yeah. a, a pretty yellow bloom. People grew it for its bloom alone, but now that now that we're marketing as a popcorn plant, and it's selling an, and even it's an better. annual too. So. Yeah, it is an annual, so you don't have to worry. And the seeds are really easy to collect and grow yeah. it next year. Yeah. Don't as a garden center owner, I don't like to get it's that out nice there. It's got a nice yellow pom pom type. <laughs> yeah, flower so it's at the real top. pretty. And petunias, no doubt, calibrico and petunias need a really low pH and not just acid fertilizer. It's it's really got to yeah. get down there. If you're on well water, it's brutal. As a, as a nursery with well water, I know more than anybody. <laughs> All right, we'll move on to Jim. Jim, if you could introduce yourself. I'm Jim Schuster. I'm a retired uh, plant pathologist with the University of Illinois Extension. And my <clears throat> first call came from Decatur. And this person has some 100-year-old mature oak trees that are dying. Uh, they start with one year, some rotting leaves, and by the end of the second year, and in, in definitely into the third year, they're dead. Which tells me you probably have red oaks, which are the oaks with the pointed lobes on their uh, leaves. And red oak, I brought that up because it's the one that gets oak wilt and is dead in two years or less. Uh, and there is no good control once the trees are maybe past 10% infection. Uh, if you catch them before they're 10% infected, you can use some uh, fungicides that have to be injected. And I would suggest that you get a professional arborist to do that so it's done correctly. Uh, if, and in the pictures, well, you can see some streaking on the branches. Uh, that you can look at and some of the dying branches that tells you that you probably have it. Um, and if you see a fungus mat, which is a, um, a kind of a, on the trunk, you left the dead tree up way too long and you're helping it to spread because squirrels will chew on the dead tree They're dr and a lot of animals besides squirrels like raccoon will eat the fungus mat and spread the disease on their teeth. Then another thing is 
the disease is spread through the tree's root system. And if they're all similar oaks, like all red oaks or all, all white oaks, uh, then they spread through the roots very well, especially with the red oaks. And, and that's the other thing your professional arborist needs to do is cut the roots between those infected trees and the healthy trees. And you may have to sacrifice a few healthy trees to save the rest of the healthy ones because the closer the healthy tree is to a dead one, the more likely you have root graft. And so you, instead of cutting between the dead one and the healthy one, you may have to cut between two healthy ones to help stop the spread. But anyway, that's what I think you have is oak wilt. Yeah, that's not what most people want to hear after nope. the emerald ash borer to hear another disease rolling through. Right. But if anybody sees a trencher going next to a tree, that's what they're doing. They're cutting the roots off so that another tree doesn't get it. It's a little saw, odd looking. I saw but somewhere they had blown over. And it's amazing how the roots had grafted together. Yeah, right. they become and one and underneath. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. All right, well, before we get to the calls, and it looks like we have a lot of calls, I want to mention that we here do a podcast. So a lot of the panelists that you see also do a podcast after hours. And this week's is episode eight with Marty Alanya. Marty's on the podcast. You can find that podcast a couple different ways. You can go to midamericangardener.org. You can go to iTunes, Stitcher, NPR One. And we do all kinds of topics, but this week's topics are hydrangea, zinnias, uh, and Arctic fire dogwoods. So uh, check it out. Anytime you have some extra time, go see the podcast if you want more Mid-American Gardener. Now we're going to go to the, the phone calls, and we're going to start with line two. Christy from Urbana has a boxwood question. Hi, I have uh, several questions actually relating to the boxwood problem. I, a few weeks ago, you uh, mentioned that uh, there was a virus um, locally, and I'm wondering if, um, number one, what the characteristics are so that I know if I, my bushes have the virus. Uh, the other thing is um, if they're uh, infected, uh, is there any way to save the plants? And if it's clearly, if they're going to have to be lost and, and, and uh, dug up, um, can you suggest any good replacement plants for the same location? Um, and thirdly, um, I have some unplanted variegated boxwood that I was planning to make um, a hedge of in my, uh, another yard. Um, is that advisable, or shall I uh, not take the trouble to get them planted? Are they going to get the virus as well? Yeah, I mean. Well, I, I'm going to say I, the virus was coming out just about the time I retired, so I have not seen a virus-infected boxwood. However, I can tell you there are no chemical controls for virus diseases in a plant, except for you dig it up and eradicate the plant so that insects can't keep spreading the disease. Uh, beyond that, um, and, and they don't affect the viruses don't affect the soil. So you can put other plants in that area, but if you already got the virus in the boxwood in that area, then I would stay away from any of the boxwoods. But I would also suggest you make sure that's what you really have because there is a, a bull. I mean, a, 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 a canker disease that is also a major problem on boxwood, and it can be killing the plant. And it causes uh, dark lesions on the uh, stems and branches of the plant. So you may want to take a good close look at that and make sure you don't have a canker versus a virus. Yeah, so at the garden center, we've gotten a lot this winter. I can probably attest. So we had heavy winter kill this year, probably as mm -hmm. much as I've ever seen. Hollies, boxwoods. So we've had more boxwoods coming in with problems than ever in the history. Right. Some of it is turning out to be blight. On the East Coast, blight is rampant mm -hmm. to the point where they can't even grow boxwood anymore. Mm -hmm. It is moving across. The tests that have come in to the, um, to the center have come back 50% uh, winter kill, and some of it is boxwood blight. There is a spray, and I don't know the chemical that they are saying that has been helpful in control mm -hmm. if it's not too bad. Um, I don't know, the, it's infusion is the name on it, but you would know more about that. But that being said, what I've seen looks so bad, I don't know that it's worth uh, doing much treatment. I would absolutely not put another boxwood in that location because I don't see this getting any better. The variegated ones are a little bit... Well, those are not very hardy in uh, to begin with. That's what I was going to say. But even the green ones are taking a hit, these yeah. huge rows. And, and I've gotten, again, a lot of pictures. Um, there are some new plants coming out. So there's a, a Ilex glabra that is called uh, Box that's made mm -hmm. to replace it. That's pretty good. We're seeing some Hetz midget arbs go in. So there's other things that you can put in there. It's not quite like a boxwood. Boxwood is one of the most popular plants mm -hmm. in Illinois. Uh, but there are plants that are being made. There's even a, a small, and it's not evergreen, but a small aronia, a new chokeberry that's cute two to three feet. 
uh, stays a nice little mound, gets the berries on it. So we're coming up with options for boxwood. I do think it's going to be a bigger problem. And there is a good chance you have blight, but winter kill was rampant this year. So I can, I've only had about 50 questions a day on this, so <laughs> I probably know a lot about it at this point. Well, thank you for calling in. We're going to go to line three, Steve from Bloomington. Uh, thank you for taking my call. I enjoy your show so much. Uh, I just wish it lasted an hour instead of a half hour. But uh, my question is, my wife and me have probably a 20-year-old upright Japanese maple. Uh, I believe it's a blood good. And I'm losing it branch by branch. And I think it I fear vertisilum will. Is there anything I can do? Thank you. Well, vertisilum will will give you a, anywhere from a greenish to a brownie streaking in the infected branches. Uh, it does spread from the soil into the plant, um, and it can eventually kill the entire plant. Cutting off the branches is one of the recommendations, but between branch cuts and definitely between an infected branch or a dead branch and a healthy one, you definitely need to sterilize the pruning tools. Mm -hmm. um, but you also would want to consider fertilizing because a, a plant that is more vigorous is more resistant or can resist the dis spread of the disease. So consider um, a proper f uh, spring fertilization uh, and the plant will take about two months to react to it, so bear that in mind. But it's also one of the reasons why we recommend you fertilize trees in the fall so that the fertilizer is working by spring. If you fertilize in the sp uh, spring, like now, uh, the tree is going to get the fertilizer e um, basically in July, and that may actually make it more prone to the vertisome because it'll put it, tell it to grow when it's in hot and dry and it wants to shut down. So um, if you can keep the plant alive to fall, like uh, September net, I would uh, consider fertilizing with like a 10-10-10, 12-12-12. Uh, properly and make sure it's w that fertilizer is well watered in. Yeah, and that's the thing about fertilizer. When people prescribe fertilizer, it's not medicine. It's just it's making you healthier. Right. You know, it's it, that's the, what we when we say that it's not going to solve it. What it's do is going to have a plant that's less you know susceptible right. to all these problems. It's so got, it's got a little bit more resistance. Yeah, it's like our disease. our body. We won't get as sick as often <clears throat> if we're and healthy. Right. Insects and diseases tend to go to those plants that are under stress. Yeah. Stress, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. And so, so that's all, all great ideas. Uh, before we get to more questions, we're going to talk about an exciting trip that the Mid-American Gardener has coming up here on June 9th. Uh, we're going to have a fan of Mid-American Gardener hop on a bus and go to the 79 acres uh, St. Louis Botanical Gardens. And you can, uh, we're going to go to the Botanical Gardens, we're going to go to Altworth's Garden Center, and we're going to have lunch at the Sassafras Restaurant. So there's time to, to uh, sign up for this trip, and it's a very inexpensive. If you donate more, $150 or more, that'll allow you to be on this trip, and that uh, can be spread over an entire year, so that's as little as $12.50 a month. So think about signing up. You get to join some of us, go down to the Botanical Garden, see some beautiful flowers, and maybe come up with some more questions for the panel. So uh, make sure to sign up for that. All right, we're gonna get back to some of the questions here. And we're going to go to line four, Jill from Toledo. Hello. 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 You have a yes, question I for have, us? Yes, I do. Um, my father-in-law gave me some horseradish to plant. And it, I know horseradish in general can be invasive. I've not interneted, you know, to check to see all the details yet. But um, any suggestions, hints? Because I, as in your horse tail, I do not want a half acre of horse credit. <laughs> <laughs> Any ideas for that one? I've never grown it. Um, what I've done is, is I've put it in an area where it can't grow any farther uh, than a, the small square. Whether you have an area where it's uh, cemented or you've got it a deep uh, um, road or something that it can't get through, uh, that's one way. It doesn't spread a lot over a short period of time. It takes a long time for it to spread. Uh, you can control it just by digging. I dig, I, you know, mine is, I've had it for about four or five years and it's gotten to be about, you know, three foot around. And I just keep going to the edge and digging up the roots that I want and grinding that up and it keeps, it, it stays in, in, 
in uh, step. Now, if you just let it go and forget about it for 10 years, you may end up with a, a whole bunch. But, yeah. uh, I'm going to suggest one way to make it, you know, if you don't have the uh, cement that you mentioned or the sidewalk net, uh, take a big five gallon or 20 gallon <laughs> bucket, cut the bottom out, leave the top three inches of the bucket sticking out of the ground, and then plant inside the bucket, uh, and that'll help the plastic of that bucket will keep it mm -hmm. from spreading in the surrounding soil. And also, keep the flower heads cut off, and it can't go to seed. Yeah, because if it goes to seed, then it can yeah, get... Yeah, then it can get... Then it can it, get pretty yeah, bad. I guess I use mine enough that I, yeah. it hasn't gone to seed. Yeah. All right, well, hopefully that helps. We're going to go to the next line. We're going to go to line five, Connie from Sullivan. Do you have a question for us, Connie? Yes, uh, we have a nut sedge weed in our lawn that we're having trouble getting rid of. We've had it for about three years and it keeps spreading. We had it professionally sprayed and it didn't work. <laughs> Move. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't, um, I don't know much about that. Yeah. sedge is one of those grasses that is kind of, it has little nodules along it. So that's why they call it nut sedge. Is that whether when you spray it, it goes it the, the even if you use Roundup, it goes down into the ground. It will absorb it, but it goes to that nut and stops there. And then you ha then it'll continue for the rest of the root, and it'll put up more growth. So uh, it's a very once you have it, uh, it's very difficult to get rid of. Uh, you have to just keep on, keep on, keep on. It's kind of like creeping Charlie and some of those others. You have to get it when it's actively growing. Uh, and then um, and reapply, reapply until it's it's gone. Yeah, yeah, you have to stay on it. The the uh, one of the herbicides that I last when I was still working that would work somewhat on it had to be done by a licensed uh, mm -hmm. professional to do it. So what you as a homeowner can buy is not going to touch it. You need to get a professional yeah. who's licensed to apply the correct herbicide, and it will still take multiple treatments. Yeah, it's going to take multiple. Yeah. All right, well, thank you very much. We're going to go to uh, line three. Carol from Greenup has a question about petunias. Yes. Um, earlier you said that petunias like acidic soil. Can I use an azalea fertilizer on my petunias? Yeah, I mean, that's essentially the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it may, it, you may need even something stronger. It may be that you need uh, that fertilizer and nothing else and then maybe change the soil even uh, halfway through the season and uh, use uh, like peat moss or something like that that's kind of acidy anyway. And, but it, it, the, the, what I, the research I did was anywhere from 4.5 to 6 is the pH that they do best in. So yeah, but yeah That's a hard the, thing to, to explain is you're not, it's not about the fertilizer, it's about changing the pH. So yeah. you're looking to reduce the pH so it will take in fertilizer mm -hmm. because when the pH gets too high, it can't take in the iron yeah. to turn it green. So it's really not about the fertilizer, it's about lowering the, whatever you need to put in to lower yeah. the pH so it can take in the fertilizer. Right. And in, generally the, in general, the fertilizers do that, right. the yeah. miracle Grow and other things. But Blueberries um, is another one that's kind of like that same even a little bit lower, and uh, yeah. it's it's very difficult with our soil and water around here to keep them healthy. Yeah. We we have to add acid, so we, we know all about that. Okay, we're going to move to one quick more one more quick question. We're going to go to Joy in Champaign. Uh, you had a question about boxwood. I'm sorry, this is not boxwood. I'm calling about bamboo. All right, well, ask your bamboo question. We can go okay. there. Okay. <laughs> uh, we have some bamboo growing bet at the border between my neighbor's house and mine, and apparently her gardener believes that it should not be cut back, even though there's all nothing but dead growth on the visible part. New green growth is coming in from underneath. Should we cut off the dead growth so that that n new green growth can come in, or should we leave it alone? All right. On bamboo? Yeah. Uh, bamboo is usually so aggressive, I just cut all the old yeah. stuff off and let yeah. the new yeah. stuff There's come no in. There's no reason. There's no need for keeping the old stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just a reminder, if you have bamboo in Champaign, you have to register your bamboo. Oh. You have to register with the city that you have bamboo, and, and if you are to plant new bamboo, you have to make sure that it's a clumping form and, and register that with the city yeah, because it, it, is such a, it is a very it's, invasive plant. Yeah. That being said, uh, cut it back. 
and it's just going to come right through. I mean, it, and this year it didn't, it was pretty warm, but on cold years, it's going to die back on its own anyway. So mm -hmm. I, can, uh, I, I like Jim's idea with the, with the, uh, the other plant, put oh, it in, yeah, a, in a large barrel and Absolutely. bury it at. Mm -hmm. and we use copper. It's an expensive way to do it, but we'll take copper and make that because you know, when the roots hit the copper, mm -hmm. it bounces back. Yeah. It's kind of expensive to put copper out there, yeah. but that works on bamboo too, but it can be, it can be pretty aggressive. So got to be careful with that. Anyway, so uh, I want to remind everybody, if you didn't get uh, your phone calls in this evening, you can still get a hold of us. There's one way to do it, and that's to call our hotline. It's actually a recording where you can call in a phone number, and it's 217-300-8224. Now, that line's open 24 hours a day. If there's anything that you would like to ask, you can ask it on this voicemail, and we'll answer it either here on the show, maybe they'll go to the podcast, uh, on the podcast, they also go through those voicemails and listen to those questions, and uh, they as well can answer all these things. And, and again, it got a little busy tonight on the phone, so if you have extra uh, questions that you couldn't ask or you don't want to ask in front of the public, you can do that on the voicemail and we'll get it to then. So I'm glad you watched the show this evening. Oh, and, and again, a reminder, we are going on this bus tour. It's a fantastic tour. They do several a year. Um, sometimes they'll come to the local ones, but this year they're going to the Bot Missouri Botanical Garden on June 9th. Uh, it is also only $150, which you can spread out over a whole year. So for $12.50 a month, you can have a great year of memories, a lifetime of memories. So Missouri make sure to sign up. For, very, very nice. It's one of the nicest it's in the nation. Really We're nice. so local to have it close. Well, again, thank you for watching. Get those questions into our voicemail. Make sure to sign up for the bus tour. We'll see you next week.